Hello and welcome to Somewhere to Believe in, a new podcast from the people who bring you Greenbelt Festival. I'm Paul and I'm the creative director of Greenbelt Festival. I'm one of your hosts for this podcast. Hello, I'm Catherine and I'm your other host for Somewhere to Believe in and the program manager at Greenbelt. If you love very small talk and huge ideas, then this podcast is for you. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Paul. Last in the series, episode eight. Yes, it has come to an end. I know, all good things come to an end. I really fooled you there, didn't I? Because I didn't say, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I was expecting it, but you've changed it up on the very last episode. Because there might be people out there, Catherine, who think that you and I just do this podcast. And so we only sort of meet over the internet to record these podcast bits. But the truth is... I've been speaking to you all day. I know. <laughs> I've been in like five different meetings with you already. <laughs> I've had enough, to be honest. I don't care how you are. Let's just get it done. <laughs> And the thing is, we're recording this and uh, this episode's going to drop just as we head into our Wild at Home Festival weekend. Yeah. Cool. Can you believe we've just about got it over the line? I know. I regret the decision to do a festival currently. <laughs> <laughs> You're in that phase, that pre-festival phase where you just want it all to go away. Are you having those dreams where you wake up and everything has gone wrong and you think, oh, no, oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Are you doing that? Yeah, I'm doing that. Yeah. I'm thinking, why couldn't we just have given it a rest this summer? We had the prime opportunity just to go on holiday. Well, we couldn't go on holiday, but, we, you know, we could have done nothing. <laughs> Have you enjoyed doing this podcast, Catherine? I've really enjoyed it. And it's also given me a lot of hope. I feel like it's given me a lot of positivity over the last couple of months. Everybody we've spoken to has seemed positive and I'm hopeful. And I also feel like I know a direction through it. I know a direction to go in next. Yeah, I've found them really inspiring and encouraging because it has been a pretty bleak time, hasn't it? When... When the pandemic first took hold earlier in the year and, you know, ordinary life as we used to know it gradually shut down, we lost the prospect of doing the physical festival, things felt sort of quite bleak. And I think that we've got a lot to be thankful for. We're very, very fortunate, all of us here who work for Greenbelt. But I think the podcast for you and I has been an added benefit, it's been a bit of an oasis. And I normally get that feeling from the festival, the physical festival, you know, I feel like that gives me energy, renewed energy to go back out and keep fighting the good fight and keep going. And without having that this year, I feel like these podcasts have actually made it up for that a little bit. That's the bits of feedback that I've enjoyed the most. You know, we've enjoyed getting all the feedback that we have. Thank you for contacting us about the podcast. A few have really stood out for me. In particular, there was one lady who emailed in and said that she hadn't been to Greenbelt for, for quite a long time now, perhaps even back when we used to be at sites like Dean Park and Castle Ashby in the 1980s and the 1990s. But she'd come across the podcast and it had sort of brought alive that Greenbelt feeling for her again. And I thought, ah, oh, that's exactly what we hoped it might do. <laughs> Do you think we should do a second series? I definitely think we should keep on going, just for my own selfish reasons. That it's just made me feel a lot better about the world. <laughs> so even if we view it through the lens of Catherine's therapy, we need to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm up for that. The well-being of every member of the team is very important. <laughs> We would love to hear from people who are the sort of artists and speakers, activists, writers that you would like us to, to be in conversation with. Catherine, have you got any ideas for who we should focus in on, on in the second series? That's a difficult question, Paul, because I don't want to spoil anything. And also, we haven't asked anybody yet. So, yeah, I've got a few ideas in mind. Artists, performance makers, activists. I look forward to seeing that list, Catherine, because you always surprise and provoke me with your ideas. <laughs> So, Paul, who have we got coming up in this episode? Well, at very short notice, we reached out to Clive Stafford-Smith, the human rights lawyer who heads up the charity Reprieve. Uh, Clive has spoken at the festival two or three times over the last 10 to 15 years. And 
absolutely love what he's had to say. He's really stirred us up. And uh, Clive was on holiday when we reached out to him. I think it's important to say that he was not at work. He was on holiday. But he answered the email and said he would love to be in conversation with us because Greenbelt is a really important space for him and Reprieve. It's a fascinating conversation with Clive as well. I, I think he blew my mind about every three minutes. Absolutely fascinating. And the conversation, we didn't want to edit it down. So the conversation is longer than our other conversations, but I don't think any of you will mind. Some of the facts and some of the stuff that Clive is saying is hard hitting. Some people might find it disturbing, but it's important. And um, so just bear that in mind going into it. So, Clive, thank you for joining us. Where, where are we talking to you today? I am sitting here in deepest Dorset, where I live, looking out of the window at a rather grey morning. And this whole COVID thing has been an extraordinary time for the trampling on the human rights of uh, all sorts of people. So it's been very busy. So not much of a holiday, I'm afraid. What do you mean that it's been a time of trampling on the rights of a lot of people? Well, you know, we don't hear about this very much. But just to give you one limited example of a person on death row in California, who's a British guy who's been sentenced to death for 37 years. And he's now 62 years old. And, you know, the Californians are pretty bad at executing people. They've only, I mean, this is too many, but they've only executed 10 people in the last quarter century. But finally, he had got a new trial because he has a very strong claim of innocence. And San Quentin, where death row is located, actually had very little COVID until the authorities bust in 120 people from another California prison, the California Institution for Men, where they had a very high rate of the virus. And of the 120, 20 of them were already tested positive, and the other 100 were in a bus for 461 miles while they drove between the prisons. And so as of May the 29th, there were basically nobody with COVID in San Quentin among the 3,082 prisoners there. A month later... There were 2,500 people who were positive with COVID and 10 people on death row had died. So they'd managed to execute 10 people, as many people as in the last quarter century this they'd done legally or quasi-legally. Uh, they managed to do that in just a, a month, which is just disgusting because it reflects how we treat our prisoners as if they're not really human beings, doesn't it? So there's all sorts of things like that going on that has just kept some of us very very busy i'm afraid how how do you how do you keep going in the face of that sort of behavior clive because you whenever you've come to greenbelt you seem to be very very positive upbeat i mean you're very very funny i don't know if it's a gallows humor but i'm always surprised at how you can maintain such resilience and seeming hopefulness in the face of what is pretty shitty news well, I mean, look, let's at no point make light of the tragedies of COVID. But, but I will say one of my philosophies is that everything that people view as a problem tends to be an opportunity. So even when you think about the dreadful state of play in the prisons in America, if you think about one of my long-term clients, Krishna Maharaj, who's 81, diabetic, heart problems, got everything wrong with the poor guy in Florida. Um, you know, we've struggled now for, uh, I've represented him since I had no gray hair 27 years ago. And, you know, we haven't managed to get him out, notwithstanding the fact that a federal judge has found that he's innocent by clear and convincing evidence, but that's not good enough. So along comes the COVID pandemic, and here's another chance. We can try and get him out on bail. Um, and he has an amazingly compelling case for bail, as you'd imagine, at 81 and being top of the vulnerability list. Now, obviously, the dreadful downside is our application for bail is predicated on the dire reality that prisons are a petri dish for the virus and that it really might kill Chris. But at least this gives us an opportunity to get him out a different way. And that's true of almost all problems that one encounters. The more that the government misbehaves, the easier it is in some ways to get justice for people. Clive, how did you first get interested in the law? 
Well, I got interested in the death penalty when I was rather young, and I actually was writing a history paper, I thought, uh, when I was in school, about 16, uh, about the death penalty, and I was slightly horrified to discover that it was a current affairs paper and America was still doing it. So, you know, look, I'm an arrogant English person, and male makes it even worse. And so I thought I'd go and sort it out, and I thought I'd go to America and write the seminal book that would convince the Americans of the error of their ways. So I went off at age 19 to do this, and I wrote this book, which will never see the light of day, except perhaps I'll let my grandchildren laugh at me at some point. But while I was doing it, I was visiting people on death row in Georgia, and I discovered that if you're on death row um, and you're poor, then you have no right to a lawyer unless someone volunteers to do it. So even though I was still convinced at the time that life on death row, my thrilling upcoming bestseller, was going to change the world, even then I could see that perhaps getting a law degree and helping people out in a rather more practical way would do more good. The way that the American legal system, I mean, our own is uh, quite complicated and impenetrable and frustrating at times, but the American legal system seems to throw up all of these things that you just can barely believe, like that fact you just said, that if you're on death row, you can't actually get a lawyer. How can a country that is seemingly so based in the law have such a an amazingly frustrating or seemingly unhelpful legal system. Well, Paul, let me back up there because I think your question makes an assumption that's probably not accurate, which is that somehow the British system is better. I think the British system is far worse in most ways. The only way in which the British system is not worse is that thus far, because Pretty Patel hasn't got her way, we don't have some of the most extreme examples of punishment. But actually, you don't have a right to a lawyer if you're in prison in Britain and you're challenging your sentence. But far worse than that, you don't have a right to a transcript. You can't even see what was done at your trial. You don't have a right to even go to court unless the Criminal Cases Review Commission says you can. Uh, And then there's all these other bizarre things in the British system about who you're allowed to talk to, whether you're allowed access to the prosecution file or the police file and so on and so forth that we'd get automatically in Mississippi. So I have to say, as an English public schoolboy, which was not my choice, that the British system, which is run, 74% of the judges in Britain are British privately educated people. And I'm afraid to say that they really don't have any concept uh, but generally about how the judicial system really works. And I would far rather be challenging my wrongful conviction in Mississippi than in Britain. So I'm afraid I started off by answering a rather different question. Now, on top of that, yeah, the, the American system, I'm half American, so I have to apologize for that too. The American system is mad in many ways. The the most deranged of all is that the Supreme Court in a case called Herrera versus Collins said that the, quote, mere fact that you're innocent is not enough standing on its own to justify you getting out of prison or not being executed. Now, that's crazy, crazy. And where that comes from is there is nothing in the US Constitution that says thou shalt not execute an innocent person. And as a result, um, some of the right-wing people on the Supreme Court decided, oh, well, that means, you know, that we can kill you if you're innocent. And those sorts of things are crazy, don't get me wrong. But at least in America, we have a First Amendment, we have free speech, we have openness, we get the government's files, we get the police files, all sorts of things that you wouldn't get in Britain. Clive, that's that's really crazy to me. What, What do you mean that it doesn't matter whether you're innocent or guilty? Well, in the case of Krishna Maharaj, we have proven that he didn't do the murder. It was done by the Colombian cartel, uh, the drug cartel. And, you know, we got I went to Colombia twice and, you know, got half a dozen cartel people to go on the record and say and publicly and swear under oath, you know, that they did these murders. And Chris had nothing to do with it. And they don't even know who Chris Maharaj is. The problem 
under American law is that the Supreme Court has said you can have a fair trial that reaches the wrong result and you only have a right to a fair trial, not a not the right result. Uh, and I suspect, you know, that you see these things throughout society. I mean, the, the children who are facing their exam results um, right now uh, in the era of COVID are probably going to be told they have a right to a fair proceeding, but it doesn't necessarily reach the right result, which strikes me as very bizarre. But um, in America, the same thing's true. So we have to, beyond proving that he's innocent, we have to prove that there was some unfairness in the trial that's attributable to the government. So, for example, we have to prove that the government covered up the evidence that um, that Chris was innocent, which we can do to a large extent, but, um, but they haven't accepted that yet, whereas the government, and or rather the, the, the court, has accepted that Chris is innocent, but he's still in prison. It is perplexing. <laughs> it's totally deranged, right? But so many yeah. things about the world are deranged. I mean, people think that CSI in a crime scene investigation is good. You know, forensic science is not science. It's total drivel. 140 people have been executed based on forensic hair analysis, and I've been banging on about this for 25 years. Finally, the FBI admitted recently that they've misstated uh, forensic hair analysis in 90% of the cases they've ever done. Now, they're wrong. They've misstated it in 100% of the cases, but uh, but at least they've come most of the way. And forensic hair analysis is just drivel uh, because it's pseudoscience dressed up as science that comes into a courtroom for only one reason, which is to try and put people in prison. And it doesn't serve any other purpose. So therefore, there are not scientists actually testing the process. And we see these sorts of things throughout the law all the time. But I'd be curious in your world. What do you look at and you say, look, a lot of people believe this stuff, but it's just crazy, crazy. Oh. Am I going to have to give you a few minutes to think about that? Yeah, you put us on the spot there, Clive. How about take one? This is an obvious one in everyone's world, prison. Mm. So, Paul, do you believe in prison? I guess in some extreme examples for people who are a danger to themselves and to others, there might be circumstances where it's best to actually keep them away from society at large. But that's not a prison. That could be a secure hospital, right? Yes. <laughs> what about you, Catherine? Mm. Who's the person you most love in life? Um, well, I guess my parents. Okay, just pick one of them. We won't discriminate. Right. I'll go Give with me a name mom. of one. We'll go with the mum. Your mum. What's her name? Yeah. Lynn. Lynn. Okay. So Lynn. Lynn is on trial in front of you. At the moment, looks a bit like Paul. I'm the prosecutor. You're the judge. And I say, Lynn's done a really bad thing. And I want you to send her to prison for a long, long stretch. Will you do it? Uh, no. Of course you wouldn't. Almost everyone would say no to that, except bizarre judges. I've tried this on a few judges, and they say yes. One judge did it with his wife sitting right there, and I don't think she's talked to him since. But, you know, none of us believe in that nonsense for people we care about. We just do it to people we don't care about, and that's obviously crazy. And actually, there are much better ways to solve those problems. So, you know, that would be one example where most people, if you ask do you believe in prison? Say yes. But when you press them on whether they'd actually do it in the setting of someone they care about, they say no. And that's, you know, it's a wacko idea where we used not to have this massive incarceration project that we have today. And I'm not saying for one second we're going to abolish, abolish prisons this week or this month, but it's madness. And we need to think about much better ways to solve those problems. When I when I was young, Clive, and, um, you know, really young and naive, I thought that prisons or the way that prisons were shown to me was that it was about rehabilitation. You know, you could kind of go there and you could get some education. You could kind of like think about what you've done wrong. And, and as I've got older, I've realized that it's not anything to do with rehabilitation. And actually, it's kind of um, the opposite of rehabilitation. It just makes things completely worse. W why don't we look at prisons in a more kind of holistic, therapeutic way? Can I ask you instead to step back again and um, look at the criminal justice system in a different way? And let's just try this one on Paul, because he obviously is going to love this. So, Paul... 
this is what I want you to do. And remember, I have this amazing mind meld ability that I know the answers before you say them. So don't lie to me, right? Now, my advice to you on this first question is whatever you do, don't answer on record because it's going to get you in terrible trouble. What is the single most despicable thing that you've ever done, Paul, that you're most ashamed of that really hurt someone else or would have if they'd known about it? Then if we add that if Catherine and I know what it is, we'd just despise you and think you're a total dweeb. <laughs> I, I, but you're it's, advising me not to answer. Yeah, but I want you to get it in your mind. Have you got it in your mind? I've got it in my mind, yeah. Shall I tell everyone what it is? Yeah. Yeah, good. What it is, and, you know, I'm just doing this mind meld thing, is it's not a criminal offense, right? The thing that you're most ashamed of. It's not actually a crime. It's something where you betrayed someone who you love dearly, as we all have, in a way that was incredibly hurtful. And, um, you know, you just feel deeply ashamed of a shitty thing to do. And we've all done that. And I've just written a book about one of mine, which you'll be able to read next year. Is that roughly true or not? It wasn't actually, uh, although I have done that as well, of course. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you've got these other ones. That's the, that's the truth for most people. It turns out that yeah. you have a dreadful criminal past that you're not willing to tell us about. <laughs> it's finally now, coming out. <laughs> now, Paul, yeah, it's, it's lucky he's got his lawyer here to tell him not to answer the question. Now, think about this one. And this is not always true for everyone. It's different for different people. But, but what's the worst criminal offence that you, Paul have been a victim of it's seemingly trivial but it's just being burgled while you're right. in the house and that right. feeling of not that what you've lost but the vulnerability of that when right. you've got small right. kids in the house and i've been held up at gunpoint seven times and because i was in america so we you know we we think that your crimes in britain you know well worrying are pretty petty compared to what we deal with all the time in the u.s because america is a mad country so now let's put it in balance which causes more harm the criminal offense that happened to you or the number of things that now Catherine's speculating that you did that you're deeply ashamed of which which is which caused more harm more lasting harm actually comes from the stuff that i haven't revealed to you that yeah. i've that I've betrayed in, you know, in my And past. that's true for most people. It's not true for everyone, but it's true for most people. So the question, this is what I was getting at, Catherine, is why is it that Paul and I, and possibly you, Catherine, are not in prison? If the judicial process is meant to prevent harm and get people not to do bad things, why aren't we in prison? Because, you know, very often when people respond that they've been a victim of a theft, um, where actually nothing happened to them and they got insurance and they got their money back and it might have been a bit scary or whatever. If you do that twice in Alabama, you go to prison for the rest of your life forever because Alabama doesn't understand that it's actually three strikes and you're out in baseball, so they've got a two-strike rule. Um, and yet at the same time, what Paul is hoping that we don't extract out of him what I've written about, where we do these dreadful things that we're really ashamed of. You know, we don't get punished at all. Why is that? <laughs> is it something about the valuing of, like, um, property or things over emotions or...? So you are a Marxist, Catherine, and you recognize that. But there are criminal offenses that are silly. It's just emotions, right? Assault yeah. is just something that puts you in fear. You don't have to touch someone to be guilty of assault, but you go to prison for it. So we have emotional crimes all over the place. So it's not just that. But there is certainly a potential argument that actually the law is designed to protect property rather than anything else for the most part. But actually, I think if you really step back, you see that the judicial process, the criminal law, is just kind of crazy. And it doesn't try to, it doesn't even attempt to do what it says on the packet. And so when you talk about rehabilitation, 
you know, that's about trying to get people to fit into a number of rules of society. And I think that all of us who do bad things need some form of habilitation. We may not not have got habilitated in the first place. But, uh, yeah, the, of course, prison doesn't make people better. It's a pointless process that tends to just teach people how to do other offenses. But, uh, but I think it needs to be rethought in a rather broader level as to why we want to call people criminals and put them all in prison. And from my perspective, the use of the word criminal is just a way that we like to look down on people, right? We like to say that they're criminals and we're not. They're bad people and we're not. And it's that mentality that drives all populists to inspire people to hate other people. And I think that's kind of pathetic and sad. So we should try and get away from all of that, really. Do you think it's 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 used as a deterrent? Do you think that that is, um, you know, don't do bad stuff or you'll be locked up? Well, it's sort of interesting that. I mean, I've got to say they always use the word deterrence. Um, but if that was really true, I was just writing something about Belarus yesterday, and they insist that they have the death penalty to act as a deterrent. But it's all secret. They don't even tell the victim's family when they're going to execute the guy. They don't tell him. They just put a bullet in the back of his head and then they won't give his body back. So the family doesn't even know their loved one has just been executed. And it's all secretive. Um, By the way, Catherine, just to make you feel better, they're so chauvinist in Belarus, the only country in Europe that still has the death penalty under Litvinenko, that... They won't allow women to get the death penalty, which I think is curiously chauvinist. Mm. Um, But if it were meant to be a deterrent, you wouldn't do it secretly, of course, would you? But think about it in, again, a broader sense. One thing that I think is fantastically positive about the evolution of the world in my lifetime is the way we treat our children. When I was sent away to boarding school, I was beaten all the time. I was beaten three times in one night just to teach me not to talk after lights were out. And that was bad. That was really uncivilized. And, you know, my parents were paying for it. But nowadays, we wouldn't dream of doing that. My son, bless him, you know, I tell him stories about the school he might go to. And he suddenly realizes he's really not being bullied that badly. I I was waterboarded in my school, which was an interesting example. What they did is they put you in a bath and they put wooden slats over the top, filled it up with cold water so you had to try to breathe. And then if you poke your nose between the slats, they'd take a pin and stick a pin in your nose to stop you doing it. And that was the sort of thing that went on in school. The way we treat kids today is so much better than that. And we're moving quite rapidly, interestingly, towards a way that we just treat people vastly better. And we don't tend to say that we're going to deter children from doing bad things by whacking them. Um, You know, we try to say that we're going to educate them and treat people, you know, teach people to do better instead of abuse them. And if we do that for our kids, which is a big step forward, then perhaps we can do that for other people. So, yeah, they throw this deterrence nonsense around that, you know, most of my clients have no thought about what's going to happen to them. And deterrence is just a fantasy, really. So, Clive, already, as expected, you're surprising us, you're putting us on the spot. What we thought we'd do is we would play a very short extract from the talk that you gave when you last came to Greenbelt, which was in 2017, when you were bringing us Greenbelters up to speed with your work with Reprieve, and particularly your increasing focus on and fascination with the whole idea of of assassination And they think they have the right to go around the world assassinating people wherever they want to. And what they do is just piss everyone off because that's what happens when we're hypocrites. When we say we stand up for the rule of law and justice and whatever, and then we take people to Abu Ghraib and torture them or we take them to Guantanamo and don't give them a trial, what that does is it just makes everyone very angry at us. And indeed, it was a CIA intelligence agent who said in my friend David Rose's book in 2004 that for everyone we're mistreating in Guantanamo Bay, we have provoked at least 10 people to want to kill us. And, you know, if you look at it in an immensely simplistic way, and I don't pretend this is not simplistic, 
actually when they did assassinate bin Laden in Abbottabad, they found among his papers a list of all the people who were members of Al-Qaeda in, on September the 10th, 2001. And it was less than 100 names fitted on one page. Now, since then, look what's happened. And, you know, all these, it was actually, it was George Osborne who said this at the lunch I was referring to earlier, and I thought he was such a twit. Um, he asked me a question, and I was trying... Yeah, I know, I realize. I'm told I'm not allowed to say the other one. The, uh, and they told me, you know what, they said on Christian radio in the morning, I can't say the word motherfucker. That's so unfair. Why can't I? Anyway, they can just beep it. Sorry about that. <laughs> Pardon my French. That's a quote about Jesus Christ, by the way, but I'm not allowed to say it tomorrow, so what the hell. Um, the, so I was talking to George Osborne, and I was trying to be conservative because I thought, you know, you don't want to make enemies. You want to make friends and try and reach out to people. So I said, I think the most conservative thing I could think of. I think that some of our policies since 9-11 have provoked people and made the world a more dangerous place. And I said that because it's obviously true. Only a total idiot could disagree. So he said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and what was so interesting is everyone at the lunch agreed with him. And I know some of those people, and they're not all idiots. It was just so fascinating as an example of what my wife calls um, politicians never receive the long brown envelope of home truths, as in no one tells them the real world. Anyway, not uh, by the by. Some of the things we do just provoke the world and make the world much more dangerous, and assassination is one of them. You know when assassination was first declared illegal in times of war and in all times? You know what year? Anyone like to hazard a guess? 1758. The Americans in the Lieber Code in 1863 said it was illegal in times of war. And, you know, everyone kind of agreed that assassination was illegal. There were discussions of assassinating Adolf Hitler, and the British said, no, 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 you're not allowed to do that. Some people came forward and said, let's assassinate Napoleon during the Napoleonic Wars. The Brits not only wouldn't go along with it, but turned them over to the French, because what they were proposing to do was a criminal offense. And the reason they did that is a real interesting mix. I mean, obviously, part of it comes from the fact that rich and powerful people don't want to be assassinated, right? So actually, if Donald Trump says we can assassinate al-Baghdadi and all these people in ISIS, then obviously ISIS are going to say we can assassinate Donald Trump because they don't care that they're going to be in the same cell as that chap over there when being prosecuted for threatening the president. Um, but, you know, so what we do, what, what the powerful people began to decide in the 1600s is the kings didn't want to be assassinated, so they started developing these rules that said you shouldn't do it. But the rules were also based in good old common sense. There was one instance when the Allies on in Europe assassinated someone in World War II. Do you know when that was? The movie's out right now. I bet you do. Heydrich, right? And you remember, is he the kind of guy you'd like to assassinate? <laughs> Possibly, yes. Yeah, okay. Can I tell you what happened? Do you remember what happened when they did... Yeah, what happened? Heydrich was, was, I guess the legal term is he was an arsehole. And he was one of the people behind the final solution. He thought it was a great idea to kill many people that we all know and love. And so the, the people in the Balkans decided to off him, and the Brits at least arguably went along with it. And what happened is they did manage to assassinate him, and the German response was this. First, they rounded up the people they thought were assassins, and some may have been, some weren't. They killed all of them. Then they went to Leidici, and they killed every single person in Leidici, then they raised the whole of Leidici to the ground, then they took 13,000 people off to the death camps, and then they put someone else in his place who was even worse. So that was the impact of assassination in World War II. The one time we did it, how do you feel about that? Not very good. Would you sort of say, no, maybe we shouldn't have done that? Would you say maybe we should? Or, or, or do it in a way that it's not clearly an assassination. And what would that be? <laughs> car accident, yes. Well, it was a car accident. He was in a car and they threw a grenade in his car. It was a big accident. Yes, but it wasn't an accident. It was visibly, it was visibly an assassination at the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. as the car came round the corner. Right. So how exactly would you do this? I'd ask other people who are better. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I tell you, this guy would make a great president. 
exactly. You don't ask other people to do his dirty work. Um, the idea still continues on. Of course the idea continues on. And unfortunately, we're doing it all the time. I have, And one of the things that happens, of course, when we do something mad is it gives license to mad people around the world to be even madder. So I have, and I'm not here because I didn't bring my laptop, but I have a copy of President Assad's kill list. And uh, I'm tempted to send your name down there. What is your name, just for the record? John Smith. <laughs> well, I, I'm surprised you didn't say Clive Stafford Smith. <laughs> that would have been the smart move, if I may say so. Um, anyway, I've got a copy of the list, and the way I got it was I got it was one deranged person gave it to another. I don't really mean that, but President Assad gave it to David Davis. And... Uh, <laughs> I, I actually love David. I think, you know, look, I've said this to him, so I'm sure he will mind me saying it in public. Um, he will mind me. I mean, I, I, I don't pretend he won't, but uh, I, half of his brain is just slightly mad, that Brexit stuff. The other half is really sensible. He's one of these libertarian Tories, and libertarian Tories are great, and David is massively opposed to torture. But Assad thought, oh, he's a Tory, he's a former paratrooper, he's got to be on my side, so here's a disc with my list of 784 people I want to assassinate, which David gave to me. And we translated it. It's great. I mean, I, you know, I'm deeply sorry to say that even John Smith is not there, but I'm going to find out. I'm going to get your picture and I'm going to put it up. I'll find out who you are, mate. I think she'll tell me after I do something awful to her feet. The, um, <laughs> oh, the tickling torture. Let's see if that works. <laughs> anyway. So on there, I mean, they're just mad because, you know, even if you accepted the theory that we should go around assassinate, assassinating people who we say are Muslim extremists, these people are just not very good at it, right? And, you know, the best example you have is the people in Guantanamo Bay, where the U.S. says that these were the worst of the worst people in the world, 779 people. I've represented 80 of them so far. I went down there in 2004. I was really interested, and it was going to be real hard work trying to defend these guys, all of whom were captured on the battlefield. But, you know, what the hell? They were all facing the death penalty, and I wasn't a big fan of that. Get down there, devil of a time, finding an honest-to-goodness terrorist. And, you know, to date, there are now 41 people total in Guantanamo Bay, 17 people like Halid Sheikh Mohammed, who actually may have done something, and then 24 who have done nothing. And all the others, all the others, and well, let's see, 41, so 738 have been cleared for release by the United States because they're no threat to anybody and they've been sent home. And so we have a 94% screw-up rate, even if you give them the 24 people, I still represent eight of them, who, believe you me, are nobodies. So when we have years and years of opportunity to abuse these people, to investigate them, to find out what we can about them, we still can't get it right. And all of those 779 would have been on a kill list if they'd had one back then. And who was it who introduced the idea of an assassination list to the United States? Who was it? Barack Obama. Uh, Catherine and I just had some questions around Guantanamo Bay. It's, it's a it's a place that we've heard of. It's almost got this mythical type of uh, mystique. It is my it. Caribbean resort of choice. I've been there <laughs> 38 times. Wow. I mean, where are we at now? You know, almost 20 years on. Well, I mean, I know that it was used way before that for Cuban refugees and all sorts. It's been a dumping ground of one sort or another for, for decades. But, you know, since 9-11, where are we at now with it, Clive, over the course of your visiting it over all those years? Well, in 2017, the there were 41 people left. There are now 40. And there's one person gone home to Saudi Arabia. And, you know, the real thing that's incredibly sad to me, I was meant to be on the phone yesterday with one of my clients, Ahmed Rabani, and we spent, I think, $4 billion on Guantanamo over the years of our tax money, and they couldn't get the phones to work. Um, but Ahmed's case is just such a great example of what happens when you have secrecy and you let the government do the mad things the government does. Because Ahmed was detained on September the 10th, 2002, and he was said to be a really bad dude, a terrorist, by the name of Hassan Gul. 
Now, he said from the beginning, no, 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 I'm not. I'm Ahmed Rabani. I'm a taxi driver from Karachi. But the U.S. had paid a bounty for him. And, you know, they wanted their money's worth. So they end up taking him to the dark prison where they tortured him for 540 days. And I'd talked to him about all of this, and I'd taken detailed notes, all of which were secret at the time, because everything the prisoners say is secret. Uh, and in the end, I got Ahmed some painting things, because he's a really good artist, and I got him to paint pictures of how he was tortured. And it included all sorts of things. And even though he had described it to me, I really had no idea until he he drew them. And he did what they call strapado, which is when you hang someone up by their wrists um, and dislocate their shoulders slowly and that sort of thing. Um, and just these awful things that had happened to him. And he insisted that he had nothing to do with extremism and he wasn't Hassan Gol and so forth. But it wasn't until the Senate torture report was released, heavily redacted, only the introduction, because sad to say, President Obama opposed its release, that we learned one rather compelling fact, which was while Ahmed was being tortured in the dark prison, the United States captured Hassan Gul, and they brought him to the dark prison, where he was cooperative, which presumably means he said he was Hassan Gul. And so they let him go back to Pakistan. He only spent two days in the dark prison. You know, it's not like he didn't totally, he didn't get a bit of abuse, but, um, but he was set free, sent back to Pakistan, where he went back to his wicked ways. And in 2012, the U.S. killed him with a drone strike. In the meantime, Ahmed Rabani was sent to Guantanamo Bay, where he's been ever since. And, you know, we, we tend to miss the human aspects of this. Ahmed's wife was pregnant when he was detained in 2002. I had a, a text this morning from his son, Jawad, who's now 17. Ahmed's never touched Jawad. Jawad. Jawad's never touched his dad. Um, I don't know if you can imagine having a child who's 17 who you've never met, you've never touched. Jawad's a nice kid. I've met him, but his father hasn't. And one of the things I'm intent on doing in the next few months is trying to get Jawad into America, which is hard, and then into Guantanamo, which is much harder, just so his dad can meet his son for the first time if the U.S. won't let poor Ahmed go. Uh, and so this is still going on. And the 23 nobodies who they have still in Guantanamo, I still represent seven of them. And they're just, I hate to say nobody, it sounds derogatory, but they really are nobody. And yet we're holding them there, some of them after 18 years. And that's because the US thinks they can keep it all secret and they can have secret proceedings and secret this and secret that and pretend that by locking up a few bearded Muslims, we're somehow doing something positive about uh, extremism. It's crazy. God, that was a bit hard to listen to, to be honest. Um, it gets what, much worse, Catherine, if you want. Sorry, I'm just trying to keep this light. What, what, what effect have you seen that that has on, on a human or on the human spirit? Well, Ahmed has been on hunger strike for six years, right? So when, what's the most time you've ever gone without eating food? Maybe like two days. Yeah, I did it just as a sympathy with him for a week. We should advise your listeners to try the Guantanamo diet. All you do is stop eating. And I lost 12 pounds in a week. But poor old Ahmed, uh, who was a small guy in the first place, he's five foot three, and he went down to 92 pounds. Um, and you, you remember what happened with Bobby Sands and the IRA. You know, he died and he became a, a figure in the movement, uh, the Americans won't allow that, so they force feed him. So every day for the last six years, Ahmed has had a big tube stuck up his nose while he's strapped in the torture chair in Guantanamo. Torture chair is what they call it. And they do this force feeding intentionally, painfully, because as General Brent Craddock said in the New York Times, they want to make it, quote, inconvenient for people to go on hunger strike. And Ahmad has endured this for six years, and he does it 
because it's the only form of peaceful protest that he can imagine. But, you know, the UN says that's torture. I don't think there's any reason to disagree with that. And it's happened to him even after his 540 days in the dark prison. We've had six years of this, and it still goes on. And the sad truth is that an awful lot of people have just forgotten these guys, and we can't allow that to happen, and we've got to close the place down. Has that cheered you up any, Catherine? Am I cheering you up, or are you just getting really, really post-traumatic stress disordered over there? I mean, it's it great is to awful. hear. It's it's, you have to, you have to hear these things. You have to be reminded about them. But awful. We have to do more than be reminded. We have to do something about it. What, what, what can we do, Clive, as as citizens? Well, you know, there is no one out there who doesn't have a talent that can be used. I'll give you just a really simple example. So with Ahmed and his pictures, I knew his pictures were not going to get through the senses, right? Because they were too graphic about his torture. And I was sitting there in Guantanamo thinking, how can I get this out? So what I did was I wrote a very detailed description of the pictures of his torture. You know, it was just me describing the pictures. And I got that through the senses, even though the pictures didn't come through. So then someone on the outside who's an artist can take my version of just describing what I'm at a drawn and reproduce it. So an artist might think that he or she has nothing to contribute to this, but it's just not true. You can do a really wonderful graphic rendition. I know what it's meant to look like, so I can help you. And then we can recreate these pictures and then we can put them all over the world. With your work with Re- Reprieve, Clive, I-, I guess there's there's this whole thing of, of uh, money and finance and, and law and legal support. And h- how do you fund the work that you do with Reprieve? Because presumably no one's no one can afford to pay you for the work that you do in terms of the people you represent. Well, I wouldn't ask them to pay me. I'm not here to take money from unfortunate people in prison. I did get paid two six packs of beer by a friend once, but that's my only attorney's fee. uh, And the beer was stolen by the guards at the Mississippi State Penitentiary, I'll have you know, which is really annoying. So 100% of my private income from the law has been stolen from me. Yeah, yeah, we're we're totally dependent on... uh, on charitable donations. And, you know, we we try to follow what I call my mother-in-law's rule, which is that the money we hold, we hold in trust for the clients. And so, you know, you don't pay yourself a big salary or nonsense like that. I mean, it's a huge privilege to do this work in the first place, so I wouldn't want to be paid a big salary. But, um, but, you know, that money is held in trust for the clients so that we can do everything possible to help people like Ahmed or people like Chris Maharaj to, to get some justice. But anyone who would like to make donation is very welcome. Mm. Go online right now to Reprieve and make a donation. It would be seriously very, very much appreciated. Uh, me, me and Paul have this discussion a lot in the office because Paul is a pacifist and I've always had a few you know, what if, what if this situation and isn't it sometimes better for the greater good? And and we have a lot of interesting discussions about that. And your talk, I think, has been the first time when it, that it has made up my mind that violence and um, that violence is never an answer. Wow. Well, I'm really pleased. I, I mean, I hate to say anything nice about Paul, obviously, but he's right. <laughs> and um, And it's It actually takes a great deal of courage to be a true pacifist, I think, because most cases are easy, right? I was having a discussion with my son's primary school head teacher some years ago, and he was in the Navy for many years, nice guy. And I asked him what was he would have contemplated taking part in as a naval officer in the last hundred years. And he said, look, the only one I'd even think about taking part in really was World War II and the rest of them were just totally counterproductive in every way and it is bad cases make bad law and and it is always the you know what do you do about Adolf Hitler case that is the hardest one for people but I can't think of another case you know the Falkland Islands for goodness sake Iraq twice all of these things cause far more trouble than uh, than they did solve anything and just killed a bunch of people and so, you know, in almost every case, it's just easy. You know, World War II is a bit tougher, but actually, in a way, 
perhaps what we should do is go backwards and look at the reasons. You know, I don't think World War II would have happened if we'd behaved a bit better after World War I. And, you know, I don't think we would have these mad, deranged leaders that we see around the world today if those of us who are on the liberal side of the world just stood up for our values instead of being pathetic and start running towards the right to try to neutralize the right. We need to stand up all the time for our principles and not just when some crazy guy in a jackboot is starting a war against us. And then I think we would go a long way towards stopping it. Can I just say something blatantly sexist? And that is against men. Sorry about this. But, you know, by and large, if you look around the world at the people running countries who during this pandemic, you see the ones who have done really badly, right? And let's just name them. They're, they're called Trump. They're called Bolsonaro. They're called Duterte. They're called Johnson, various others. And they have one thing going for them, and that's that they're all men, or one thing in common, not going for them. The countries that have done far better are run by, um, by you know, Ms. Ahern or Ms. Merkel or whatever. And I think we should begin in our military by appointing every general as a woman to make up for the last 10,000 years. And, you know, that won't solve all the problems of the world, but I think it'll solve quite a few. Agreed. Are you taking the job, Catherine? Can I, or should we call you General Catherine from now on? What's the outfit like? Well, Admiral. Would you like, rather be a, you know, Air Vice Marshal, an Admiral, or a General? Depends on the hat. So, Clive, we um, obviously the Greenbelt constituency is a particular sort of community. Uh, a lot They're of them, rather nice people. Uh, well, I hate to say, a lot of them are Christian. Many of them are churchgoers. Is there a way that the the faith communities, more generally, can play more of a role in working for the for a transformation of what we think is is a, is a functioning criminal justice system? When I, when I used to try capital cases, I would always pick. Christians. And, you know, I'd begin by saying, let me try this on you. Um, what's the worst crime, Paul, that a human being can commit? Murder. That's What would a Pentecostal Christian say? A blasphemy. <laughs> Normally failing to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Now, if you begin a death penalty trial with jurors who think that's a worse crime than murder, and if your client, for all his or her failings, is Christian, then you're beginning pretty well. I mean, in one case, uh, the prosecutor was complaining that I was banging on about religion all the time. And it became pretty clear to the jurors, the 12 Pentecostals we picked, that she was guilty of a greater crime than my client. And uh, <laughs> that's a good place to be in any trial. And the same is true of all these other things like love your neighbor as yourself and so on and so forth, because they remind us of some pretty basic issues about how we should run our society. So, you know, I don't know whether this is helpful at all, probably not, but First and foremost, people who do believe in the Bible, you know, we should, we should use that language and really, really believe in it and act like it, because that's the best thing you can do as a person, let alone as a Christian, is to behave in the way that your principles actually dictate. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's cool. It's actually very nice. And I, I think that I do, I always used to threaten people and I'd say, look, if you help me on this case, you won't get eternal damnation. You'll get into purgatory. You won't get into heaven because that's full of very boring people. But purgatory is where the cool people are. <laughs> but, you know, the trouble is most people don't really buy that they're going to hell anyhow. So my threat is no longer very valid. So perhaps we should just rejig it and say, look, if you behave nicely, it just makes the world go round. If we, instead of groveling after money and our own self-benefit, but just to look around, do what my mum used to say, which is just look for people who are worse off than you are and try and help them. You know, that just makes the world a much better place. And it's so self-evidently right. I will say that if you want to know, know my 
views on mad ideas, which you may not. I think capitalism is just crazy, crazy, right? I mean, the idea that, that we're going to make the world better by just groveling after money ourselves is just absurd. So, you know, just follow your principles is all you need to do, and that'll lead you somewhere great. And what I say to all my students this summer is let's identify your passion. Let's identify what really floats your boat. And then let's figure out a way that you can spend the rest of your life doing that. So, Catherine, what floats your boat? What are you really passionate about? I've always been passionate about the arts and about using it to tell good stories. Okay. And Paul, what about you? Yeah, likewise, passionate about the arts, but I'm also a person of faith. So I'm always looking for ways that those things can connect to try and uh, open people's minds, shape behavior, start a movement. (laughs) I'd love to know what it is that makes you passionate about art, right, or the arts. Because what I love to do and explore with my students is what is underneath that passion? What are the principles that guide it? And then how can we put it into action that really makes a difference? And, you know, on a very basic level, Catherine, you've talked about telling stories and this, that, and the other. Clearly, telling stories that achieve justice, which I have a sense probably is something you're into, is really powerful. And I found it fascinating taking half a dozen British artists to Pakistan when we were doing drone work that on the plane over, the British artists are banging on about how political art is so boring. And I'm thinking, what is wrong with you people? I mean, come on. Do you like ABBA or do you like... I mean, I like ABBA. But do you like ABBA or do you like something that has a little politics? So we get to Pakistan and the Pakistani artists thought the British artists were crazy. And the Pakistani artists were saying, what's the point of art if it doesn't have a political impact? And when it came time to doing art about drones and about assassination and killing children, you know, everyone pretty much came around. And it was just really interesting to see the impact of that and how, for example, one photographer who had expressed a certain disdain for political art ended up doing amazingly dramatic black and white pictures of the fragments of the drone missiles that had killed children with the serial numbers on those missile parts so we could trace them back to the manufacturer so we could blame the manufacturer for killing a bunch of children and so forth. And, you know, that was fantastic. And and there's always a way to to explore your passion about the arts and explore your other love, you know, if it happens to be, I hope, about um, about doing a little good in the world and figuring out a way to make the two of them mesh so that you get into purgatory, which at least with Paul is going to work as a threat because he's headed for hell, obviously, after <laughs> everything he said today. So we're going to have to work on a bit of that. The, the, uh, Paul's probably not Catholic, but we need to get him in there to make his confession and get a get a bit of a, a promise that he's going to have. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Clive, thank you so much for your being so generous with your time on, on holiday as you are. Can I ask you how have you managed to play any cricket in COVID in a COVID summer? See, this is the thing. And the reason I'm secretly glad that I don't have a date to come to uh, Greenbelt on bank holiday is I've got a big cricket match then and I'd have to choose. Yeah, we played a lot of cricket. It's been great this season because the moment that the person living in number 10 Downing Street finally worked out that cricket is not a sport where we all hang out really close together. And if I'm finding, if I'm fielding at long leg, I'm 100 yards from the nearest human being. Since then, we've been playing three matches a week. And oh, so great life. I, how about you guys? I think you count off the years of your, your life through blackberries and the cricket season. And I need lots of young people to take up the human rights stuff so I can just retire and become an international <laughs> cricket star in my fantasy. But in the meantime, we'll just have to settle for the map and marauders. Well, thank you, Clive. Uh, thank you for putting us on the spot as well. That's been the most questions we've been asked in these conversations. So thank you very much. Well, it's much more fun that way. Yeah. And Catherine, I'm, when you find out the secrets, just send me I'll an email. I'll let you know. I'll let you know. <laughs> Good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Bye. Thanks so much, Clive. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Sure. Bye. 
So that was, uh, <laughs> well, one of the most amazing conversations I've ever been part of. Clive was being so generous with his time, he would have been happy to keep on talking with us. Yeah, I wanted to keep on talking. I like learning. I like realising that how little I know and how much work there is still to do. And there were so many times in that conversation where I thought, I don't know anything about this. You're making me rethink this. <laughs> I mean, I went straight in there with him and I said, cool, you know, isn't the US legal system nuts? And he came straight back and said, yeah, I mean, it's a bit frustrating, but ours here in the UK is a lot worse. Yeah, I had no idea about that because I kind of followed lots of different American crime docuseries and podcasts and stuff like that. And so I had a real understanding of how it's absolutely bonkers and you know a lot of times doesn't churn out anything close to justice to hear ours is worse it made me realize really how little i understand of or, or know about the law at all and i guess that also made me think how privileged i am that i've never had to really really rely on the law to look after my rights yeah it's put a magnifying glass and the things that i thought were there for my benefit that were just and that were kind of keeping society together and it's just kind of blown that all apart in a really good way you say you like watching american crime series and docudramas and stuff what about the fact that forensic science isn't science at all in clive's opinion why aren't people talking about that something that i've picked up from the american system is that normally things only get brought in to court by the prosecutor that will prove somebody is guilty so stuff doesn't get brought in if it doesn't show that they're guilty or if it shows something else yeah, at first i thought oh yeah perhaps that's just a little bee that he's got in his bonnet <laughs> but then he said he talked about the percentage of cases that are getting overturned and re-examined that have proved to be completely wrong i thought how little we know <laughs> And then, of course, we got into the meat of the conversation with him about his work with the detainees in Guantanamo Bay. That was really hard, wasn't it? The thing is, I don't think, even if I could think of the worst criminal in my mind and I could think about some of the worst crimes that they could commit, I don't even think it would get close to describing what the US government have done to that particular prisoner Ahmed Rabini and I'm sure it's happened to other prisoners in Guantanamo Bay it doesn't even get close to that to think of someone being tortured for over 500 days and to think of someone being force fed in a painful way for six or seven years I couldn't have even imagined such brutality and that it's still happening like it's still happening that guy is still in prison and he's still being force fed yeah it's really really hard to hear and I I can't I can't believe how someone can well, I can because humans are amazing and they're full of love and compassion and commitment and a drive for justice. But Clive goes back there. He called it his Caribbean island resort of choice. But he keeps going back there and defending these people time and time again. He's made of strong stuff, isn't he? Because I don't think I could do that. I mean, that one, you know, 15 minute story has affected me. Like, how can you make that part of your life and still be seeing any good in the world or be seeing I would just you know small injustices make me go absolutely nuts emotionally crazy but I mean Clive is an incredible person and I know that he he brought up in that talk then that he's been held up at gunpoint seven times and there's more details about this in the talk but one of the times that he was held up at gunpoint he was actually shot he was mugged and shot and after he was like healing in hospital and he came out, I think somebody asked him, said, oh, I think we know who it is. We can go and arrest him. And he was like, I don't want you to go and arrest him. I try and keep people out of jail because I think it's an absolute waste of time. I don't want them arrested. But then one further than that, he was like, but I do want them to stop mugging people. So he went to try and find them. And he was just going to walk up to them and tell them, hey, I guess stop mugging people please people that shot him and the only reason he saw them the only reason he didn't walk up to them is because he thought you know what if it wasn't them what if this was another case of mistaken identity which happened so much in the criminal system and which he has always fought against so even in that final thinking all of those actions were so selfless <laughs> He 
he seems really committed to being as empathetic as he possibly can and you know putting himself in other people's shoes really trying to understand what it must feel like you know what life must be like and that for me has emerged as a quite a strong theme across all of these podcasts i think you talked about it actually in one of the earlier podcast episodes where you said you know what sort of leadership are you looking for and you were saying wouldn't it be great if we could have a new crop of leaders who instead of like the strong men across the world that we've got at the moment like you know bolsonaro erdogan trump etc could be vulnerable you know where there could be a new model of leadership which says hey hold on we've still got lots to learn here hold on let's just take our time let's listen let's let's be vulnerable that vulnerability i think is something that i know that you value particularly because you don't see that in our leaders you see people that are kind of giving off power and authority and to me it's a very dated kind of icons that we're looking up to whereas all the people that we've spoken to you know like Clive Stafford Smith he's an intelligent guy I think he said he was like educated at Oxford and he went had private boarding school like he could be earning vast amounts of money and you know doing whatever he wanted in this world but instead he's chosen a completely different path while we were talking to clive so many things were whirling round in my head and my heart about all the conversations that we've had and it it almost felt like everything was coming together not in some sort of like like master plan (laughs) but it felt like all these threads you know we've been thinking across the summer about Black Lives Matter, about inequality, about climate emergency, about inclusivity. We've been thinking about this in our Wild at Home programming and in our conversations with all the guests. And it seemed like it was all coming together at the heart of my Christian faith, at the heart of the Christian story that sort of animates and inspires Greenbelt is an executed innocent man. And, you know, I don't want to get all preachy about it, but it has really, really made me think of, you know, why is it that God placed at the at the heart and the center of everything in terms of God's connection and love for us as humanity and for the world? Why is it at the heart of that is an executed man, an executed innocent man who we call Jesus Christ? I just think there's something in there. And it made me think about the Black Lives Matter movement and the conversations that we had earlier in the summer where Black liberation theologians connect the crucifixion with lynchings. Um, And then I thought about, you know, we've thought about colonialism a lot as well through these podcasts and across the summer. And I was thinking, you know, this innocent man died at the hands of a colonial power, the Romans in Palestine at the time. It's just brought me back to that old story in a way. And it's made me think how resonant that story still is. So this is the last of our first series, but we do hope to be back with a second series in the autumn. Not quite sure when yet, but keep your eyes out on social media and we will let you know. Thank you for making the journey with us this summer. Yeah, thank you for listening to us and indulging us. (laughs) We've still got this email set up stbi at greenbelt.org.uk so you can email us there about the podcast things you'd like to see and our social media handles are at greenbelt on twitter and at greenbelt festival on facebook and instagram we'd love to hear from you on those platforms yeah if anybody has any ideas of artists for the next season if anybody knows patty smith hey clive stafford smith and patty smith there might be something there (laughs) i mean it's quite a rare surname (laughs) Yeah, Patty Smith. I mean, it goes without saying. I I don't think we could finish this podcast series without mentioning Patty one more time. I don't think I could. I don't think I've mentioned her enough. No. (laughs) I don't know if the listeners can tell, but Catherine and I are very, very tired. Um, (laughs) We're just about there with the Wild at Home Festival, but it's, um, as always, when you make a festival, it does slightly, slightly do you in just before it happens. But thank you for bearing with us. We'd also like to say thank you to all the people who've helped us make these podcasts. 
to Daisy, who's put everything together, got it all published, done all the artwork. Thanks ever so much, Daisy. And to Kat and Josh and our recorded talks team, who actually do a wonderful job of making us sound as if we actually know what we're doing. It's very useful. <laughs> and to Paul Truman, who helps us think about the sorts of questions and the angles that we could go for. We'd also like to say a big thank you to Lee Baines of Lee Baines the Third and the Glory Fires for letting us use his amazing track, I Can Change, for the theme tune on our podcasts. But I guess most of all, we'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you.